Timmy Spanigal is a Midwestern farm boy. And one of his many jobs is feeding the chickens on his father's farm. What's his life like? And how is farm life different from what it was a few years ago? We'll find out today when Discovery goes to the town of Villa Grove, Illinois, for a first-hand look at the farm country. Discovery 68, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. The Spanigal Farm is located in central eastern Illinois, right in the middle of the vast flatlands that make up most of the Middle Western farm country. Compared with city life, there aren't many people out here, but there are farms as far as the eye can see. The animals get their breakfast before the farmer does, but farmers still have to get up early, about five o'clock in the morning, because their animals get up early. The animals go to sleep when the light of the sun is gone. They awake when the sun reappears. A farmer does much the same thing. But a lot of things about farm life have changed in the past few years. So many things that you might be amazed at what life is like today down on the farm. The day begins with breakfast at about 5.30 in the morning. This part of farm life hasn't changed at all. Breakfast is hearty because farm people need a good deal of energy to do their work. There's ham and eggs, rolls, cereal, fresh fruit, orange juice, milk, and coffee for the grown-ups. This is the Spanigal family. James Spanigal, the father, is 42 years old. The mother's name is Bernadine. Jim, the oldest son, is 19 and a student at the University of Illinois. John is next in line at 17. He's a high school senior who likes sports. Mary Ann is 15. She's a sophomore in high school. Janet is 11 and is in grade school. Timmy is the youngest member of the family. He's seven and a half and interested in just about everything. Each morning, before and after breakfast, there are chores for the children to do. They're not very hard chores the way they used to be sometimes. In fact, the children enjoy them. It looks as if there are different items here on the feeder that Timmy is giving to the chickens, Mr. Spanigal. Yeah, a chicken will balance his own diet, so we just put out things here and let them choose their own as they need it. This side here, we have whole oats with little corn scattered in to give them a little appetizer. How about this? That's what you call supplement. It's protein with vitamins and minerals that's generally lacking in your grains. Now, these look like little rocks to me. That's right. That's what it is, just ground up rocks. And the chicken eats the rock. That's right. What since, do you call this? That's what you call grit. Grit. Since a chicken doesn't have any teeth to grind up the feed, they have to use rocks to chew up this feed and and supplement. Helps their digestion. That's right. Too. Now, what about this? That's ground oyster shells. And the chicken actually eats oyster shells. That's right. It's used to make the shell of the egg. Without oyster shells, the eggs would have a soft shell on. Well, that's something I didn't know. Now, this is the feed for laying hens, right? Right. What about the other chickens around here? Do they have the same diet or something it's else? It's a little bit simpler. They have a ration, looks like this here, that has a grain and supplement mixed together. Mm -hmm. Now, this looks like the place where Timmy uh, waters the chickens. That's right. That's a waterer. A waterer. A hen needs a lot of water to produce her eggs. Now, I noticed that uh, most of the chickens around here have yellow legs, but the one that Timmy is holding has a pair of white legs. What's the reason for that? Well, she's an old hen that has laid a lot of eggs. Well, how often does a hen lay an egg? She lays an egg about every other day. One egg about every other right. day. Looks like the chickens are doing pretty well. Let's find out now about the vegetables. OK. What kind of vegetables do you have out here, Mr. Spanigal? We have several out in this field. Over yonder is the potato pads. Uh -huh. Then we've got some uh, cabbage, tomatoes, uh, cucumber pads, sweet potatoes and even some muskmelons. Oh, muskmelons. They're a great deal like cantaloupe, aren't That's they? That's right. Now, how long do they take to raise? About three months till they're ready to eat. This one looks like it's about right. Yes, this might be a good one. Let me break it off here. Now, if we cut into this, we might see some seeds inside, right? That's right. There's a big opening inside with the, with the seeds in it. And what will happen if you plant the seeds? Uh, after you take the seeds out and dry them, they can be used next year to raise more cantaloupes. There they are. That beautiful muskmelon there. Now, I notice over in this next patch here, there's some vegetables 
Uh, the plants look a great deal like these cantaloupe vines. Yes, these are cucumbers. They have a vine similar to the mushmelon. They're planted in hills just like mushmelon, and then they spread out like these here. I know what cucumbers are, of course, but I don't see any in there. They hide under the leaves, whereas your mushmelons are pretty well in the open. All right, here's a nice one. You're right. It's almost camouflaged in there, isn't That's it? That's right. How long does that take to grow? Oh, a little better than two months. About two months to raise a cucumber. Now, there's something I recognize over there. I've raised those myself, tomato plants. Well, some of your tomatoes are already ripe. This one yes. here looks like a beauty. May I pick this? Sure, go ahead. That's a nice one. Now, how many uh, tomatoes can you expect from an average plant? Oh, around 50 or so. About 50. Now, I can, of course, tell when a tomato is ripe just by looking at it. You can tell by the bright red color. But one thing I've often wondered is how you tell when it's time to pick a cabbage. Well, generally, you have to pinch a head of cabbage to see whether it's ready to cut. They must be salt before it's ready to cut off. Now, these here are all ready to go here. Let's pick one and see what it looks like. You only get one from each plant, don't you? That's right. You get one big head. And generally, if you have a lot of rain, they'll make a, several little bitty heads there. Oh, yes, over here. Look almost like Brussels sprouts, don't they? That's several right. Several small heads of cabbage. There it is. Now, you told me a few minutes ago that we uh, have potatoes in that field over there, but I don't see any. Where are they? Yes, the vines have died on the potatoes, so it don't look like there's anything over there right now. Well, how do you know where to look for the potatoes? The potatoes were planted in rows, so we looked for the dead vine. Like this one here. That's right. Now, this was green at one time. That's right. After the vine dies off, then the potatoes are ready to dig. So there should be some potatoes right here in this little hill. We hope hill. so. All right. How many do you expect to find there? Oh, one to half a dozen. Well, let's see how many are under that pitchfork. There's one, there's two, three, four, five. Five potatoes right there. That's a nice hill. It sure is. Now, uh, I know that you don't plant seeds when you raise potatoes. What do you use? We use the eye out of a potato. You take a potato here, these little holes here is the eye. You take, cut one or two of them into a hunk of potato. Uh-huh. Then you take and dig a furrow in the ground and lay this piece of potato in the furrow and cover it up. Now, who helps out in the potato fields here? Jenny, everybody gets in the act of hoeing them. I don't see Timmy. I think he's over watering the hogs. It's his turn to do that. <laughs> Farm life isn't what it used to be. It's not as hard as it was. And it's very much, for a mother, like the life one would lead in the suburbs of a city. Here in the Midwest, we live very much like people do in the suburbs. We have a family life here, very simple, and I belong to several organizations in the community. We have um, treasurer of the St. Anne's Society. We are involved in the school activities of the PTA. Well, I help with the girls is uh, FHA, which is the Future Homemakers of America, and the boys, which is FFA, which is the Future Farmers of America. And through the years, I have been the 4-H leader. We have also uh, have the girls here to help through the summer when we do the canning and preserving. And I help them with their 4-H projects through the summer, their sewing and cooking activities. Farm children come to know naturally more about life at an earlier age than most city children. They see plants and animals being born, growing, and dying. The cycle of life is revealed to them at an early age, and sex and the riddle of birth aren't as mysterious on a farm as they are in a city. Even the traits of living things are revealed earlier to a farm child than to his city counterpart, who deals essentially with other humans or household pets. What Mr. Spanigal and Jim are doing now is driving to work on their farm, very much as your father might drive to his office. The Spanigal farm comprises 260 acres, but none of it is adjacent to the house. One parcel of 80 acres is two and a half miles away. The rest of it is about 12 miles from the house. That might sound strange, but that's the way many small farmers in the Midwest live today. We'll find out how to tell a good ear of corn from a bad one. And we'll take a look at a bean that's used to make everything from salad dressing to printer's ink. 
And we'll do all that in just a minute. Much like your father might go to his office, or his factory, or wherever he works, many of today's farmers drive to their jobs. Many of today's farms are rented farms. The farmer leases the land from the owner, frequently a bank or a land-owning corporation. This makes the Midwestern farmer almost as much a commuter as today's businessman who lives in the suburbs. He goes to work on wheels, those automobile wheels that have come to shape much of our life in the United States. The Spanigals plant two crops a year, corn and soybeans. The corn is planted around the 1st of May, the soybeans about the middle of May. A field of tall corn is an impressive sight, but it's no longer considered an indication of how good the corn crop is. Modern farmers have other ways of evaluating corn. Mr. Spanigal, what do you look for when you're inspecting your corn crop? Well, as you mentioned, a tall stalk will blow over much easier than a short one in a windstorm. Mm -hmm. So we Jay look for a well-pollinated ear on each stalk. Now this one has one. a couple of ears, doesn't it? That's right. What will you do with the smaller ear? Will you harvest that? It will run through the machine, but all it will be in is the cob, mm -hmm. since it was not pollinated. Well, what do you mean by pollination? Well, this at the top here is what you call a tassel. That's the male part of the plant. Little bitty bags of pollen is grown on, on these, each one of these little branches here. As the pollen is ripe, it drops down and ends on, on the end of these little silks here. These silks go inside the husk and go onto all parts of the cob, making rows on the cob there. Now you mentioned this is the male portion of the plant, That's so right. this would be the female part. That would be the here. female part. So your pollen has to get from here to here, from that, the male to the female. That's right. What's it look like inside? Okay, let's take a look here. This will be a good way of telling whether it's a good ear, won't it? There's kind of a rich golden color down here, but on this end, it's uh, on the white side and uh, kind of jagged, these little kernels. That's right. These were pollinated down this end here, but these up here had very poor pollination. I see. So that's your way of seeing how well it has been pollinated. That's right. How do you go about planting the corn? Well, farmers in the past would go into the cornfield and pick out a nice ear. Then they would dry it and keep it stored through the winter. Then next spring, they would go out and shell this corn and go out with a stick and drag a furrow on the ground and take and put the kernel in the ground and cover it up with their foot or hand. Just one kernel at a time. That's so right. In the ground. Now, uh, today, of course, they do it differently. Don't they use uh, seed corn today rather than the commercial That's corn? That's right. They have special companies that produce the seed for us to plant our crops with. Now, this would be a tedious process to do. I'm sure they don't do it that way today. No. Today, we have planters. Uh, we can plant as much from four to eight rows at a time. I'd like to see how it's done. Well, that looks a lot more efficient than planting corn with a stick. And a lot easier, too. <laughs> I'll show you how we do it. Bill, this cultivator has 23 shanks on. Each has a sweep at the bottom of it. As a tractor pulls the cultivator through the ground, it tears out all weeds, and loosens up your ground so it'll have a nice seed bed for the kernel of corn to grow in. Jim, raise her up. The planter's back here, Bill. This is a seed box where we put the corn in. The corn looks just like candy corn. It has a chemical coating on it to protect it from the cold weather and insects. It would have taken a farmhand weeks to do what Jim is doing with this machine in a matter of hours. Each kernel becomes a stalk until the stalks become green fields and return the investment of care and attention a hundred times over. Oddly enough, in today's society, that return isn't enough. This is one of the strangely sad things about American farming. Even if you farm well, as the Spanigals do, it doesn't pay very much anymore. One of the crops that is relatively profitable is soybeans. Illinois grows twice as many soybeans as any state in the Union. Soybeans are a rather unusual plant. The stalks and leaves are used for feeding livestock. Inside each pod, you'll normally find three or four little soybeans. The beans are 80% oil and 20% meal. 
Now let's see how many we find inside this pot. There's one, two, three inside here. The oil is used in making everything from salad dressing to printer's ink. The meal is used in making items ranging from bread to household furniture. So the soybean is an extremely versatile plant. In my grandfather's day, 80 acres of ground would support a family comfortably. In my father's day, it took him oh, at least 160 acres to feed us. Today, it takes around 320 acres to even to think about uh, starting to farm. Since I've only had 260 acres, uh, having built a new home uh, with a boy in college and several more coming up to go to college, uh, I figured it was necessary for me to add to my farm income. So last winter, I had opportunity to uh, get a job in a nearby town. We have time during the winter and in, in between the planting and harvest to uh, do other things. So this uh, work in town works, works out just fine. I can, when I ain't farming, I can be working in town. And we can use the income real well. Right now I'm a sophomore at the University of Illinois and I'm majoring in general agriculture. And I like very much to go into farming after I graduate, but the future farming is rather dim right now. Land costs between $700 and $800 an acre, and in some instances more, and it costs tens of thousands of dollars for machinery alone. So I might go into vocational agriculture or perhaps horticulture after uh, I graduate. Despite the fact there are now fewer farmers than ever before in the history of our country, farming continues to give jobs to more people than any industry in the United States. More than 40% of all Americans make their living because of farming and related industries. Even though it is hard to make a living out here in the country on smaller acres, I wouldn't give it up for anything. Not so much for my own sake, but for my children's sake. It's a healthy way of life, and the children can learn things on the farm where they can't learn anyplace else. So for the Spanigal family, farm life is pleasant and rewarding even if it doesn't earn them a complete living. We'll be back to show you how the Spanigals built most of their own home, to find out how to milk a cow, and to look on as Timmy meets a baby pig that's only eight hours old. And we'll do all that in just a minute. Most of the Spanigal family home was put together in this fashion. Everybody chips in, whether they're talented or not. The nail hammering, the digging, the wall siding were all done by the Spanigals themselves. While the house was being built from June until November of last year, the family lived in this garage. Meanwhile, the farm had to keep on running. And again, everybody chipped in. One of the chores that must be done each day is milking. Most milking today is done by machine, but on small farms, the family cows are still milked by hand. Rich, you get yourself down low here and get yourself underneath. You put your leg up against her leg here. That's to protect yourself and, and the milk bucket. If you gently put your bucket in between your legs like this, but set yours so little, you can set yours down on the floor down. You grab hold of the teats like this here. Squeeze a little bit and just pull up and just keep it pulling on like that. And keep it working. It's very important to milk a cow a couple of times a day, because if you don't, her bag will get full of milk and be tight. And after a few days, she'll quit giving milk altogether. And always milk the cow on the right side, because that's the, cat, the side that she's was used, to, got used to uh, be, being milked by. But otherwise, you milk on the other side, she'll get excited, and we'll let you milk her at all. You think you could do it, Timmy? Mm -hmm. OK, let's try it here. Remember what I said now. Get, your, get yourself under there. Get your foot. That's the way. Just put the bucket on the floor down there. You have to just squeeze and pull on. Just keep it working. It's hard. It's hard to get it to come down. Just keep it working, though. Now try, try the other ones there, some. Keep work all of them. That's the way. Well, that's all the milk we can get this time, Tim. Take the milk up to your mom, then come over to the sow barn. The mystery of life is revealed to the farm boy much sooner than it's explained to the city boy. Mr. Spanigal is now taking Timmy to see some newborn pigs. 
some of the pigs are only eight hours old. The baby pigs are kept warm and dry. And for the first few weeks, their favorite diet is mother's milk. Supper is at six o'clock on the farm, and it's going to be on time today because the Spanigals are preparing for their annual trip to the state fair in Springfield, a hundred miles away. In past years, the families won many blue ribbons for their vegetables, eggs, and flowers. But whether the Spanigals win any blue ribbons or not is not too important. What is important to them is that their prize entries represent the fruit of their labors. As farmers, as good citizens of their community, and as a family that has chosen its own way of life in the heart of the Midwestern farm country. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed Discovery's visit with a farm family in Illinois today. If you'd like to find out more about farm life in America, ask your librarian for any of these books. Miracles on Maple Hill by Virginia Sorensen. Farm Boy by Douglas Gorsline and Farm Animals by Dorothy Childs Hogner. Next week, we'll be back with the Spanigals when Discovery goes to the Illinois State Fair for a first-hand look at prize steers, Ferris wheels, and cotton candy. Be with us then. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Unit's transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.